This film is brought to you by New York Life and its dedicated agents. Proud sponsors of the NFL's team highlight films. New York Life, the company you keep. On December 22nd, the Miami Dolphins 1991 season came down to 60 minutes of football. Dolphins against the Jets, always a barn burner, and today will be no exception with all the marbles at stake for the final playoff spot, uh, the final wild card spot in the American Football Conference. All right, all, it all boils down to this. We gotta have it now. We're alive, baby. That's the important thing. We keep playing with this. Miami did have to have it, so they simply went out and took it. First, they took the body by sacking Ken O'Brien four times. Then, they took the ball. Here's the pass. It is intercepted. Off a tip at the 49-yard line. Of the, the interception gave Miami a chance to tie the score at seven, and nobody turns opportunity into success better than Dan Marino. Here's the snap. Marino back to throw. He's looking. Clock is moving three seconds. Goes for a touchdown. With under a minute to play, however, the Dolphins trailed 17 to 13. This gets us down. If they don't score, Jim, we, don't, we win. If they don't score, we win. Hey, Dan, you're getting stiff. Huh? The pressure was decidedly on. With the playoff seemingly only a yard away, Dolphins fans knew it wasn't a question of if, but how Marino would find the end zone. We have fourth down coming up at the one yard line. There's Marino, throws in the end zone. Caught for a touchdown. Bliss quickly ceded to disbelief, however, as the Jets sent the game into overtime, where a sweaty season of grace and gumption was vanquished by a single swing of a kicker's right leg. Here it is, set down, the kick is up. It is good, and the Jets win the ball game. To simply look at the season as one in which the playoffs were missed would be missing the point. Because a season cannot be measured solely by the final standings, let your mind soar to the possibilities of other measures of achievement. Like passes defying gravity, a receiver defying the odds, the palpable pop of a hit so hard it changes the taste in your mouth, or a play so big it changes the momentum of the game. For the Dolphins, the 1991 season was a test of character, a year where unforeseen injuries, Herculean effort, and down-to-the-wire decisions combined to make it a season of blood, sweat, and tears. On opening day versus the Bills, Don Shula's charges heard and heeded, then wasted little time building a 14 to nothing lead. Here's the flea flicker coming up. Marino going deep to the far side of the field. Man down there is caught. Down at the five yard line, in for a touchdown. In for a touchdown, goes Mark. With Buffalo forced to respect the run thanks to Mark Higgs, career high 146 yards rushing, the Dolphins look for new ways to exploit the pass. Marino's read was letter perfect, but the numbers looked even better as Mark Clayton's second touchdown of the game gave Miami a 24 to 21 lead in the fourth quarter. It was a lead, however, the Dolphins would prove unable to hold. On this opening day extravaganza of offense, the Dolphins accumulated nearly 400 yards of offense. The defending AFC champion Bills simply outlasted Miami, defeating the Dolphins 35 to 31. 
If the season's direction seemed unclear, the Dolphins quickly found their focus and their way in the home opener against Indianapolis. The trail to victory led straight to the Colts' backfield, where the Dolphins corralled a would-be Pony Express, holding the Colts to a paltry 150 yards and two harmless field goals. And while the defense broke the Colts' spirit, Miami's offense discovered some thoroughbreds of their own. While rookie Aaron Kraber's first career touchdown gave the Dolphins a lead they would never relinquish, Mark Higgs became the first Dolphin runner since 1982 to run for more than 100 yards in consecutive games. But the emergence of Higgs as a capable runner was more than a pleasant surprise. It was a necessity. We opened the season with uh, everything resting on Mark Higgs, and he came through for us. I mean, he delivered. So this, as a coach, this is what you're happy to be around, when, when a guy that works hard gets an opportunity and then delivers. I just, I've been setting him up. I ain't through no moves on the safety end. But Higgs did make the moves, and he more than made the grade. A plan B acquisition, Higgs got high marks as the Dolphins' leading 1991 rusher. Moreover, his 905 yards were the most for a Dolphin runner since 1978. With the speed to turn the corner and the toughness to go over the top, Higgs was arguably the most pleasant surprise of the season. Still, Higgs isn't the only first-class back in Miami. Sammy Smith was slowed by injuries in 1991, but still managed to finish second on the team in rushing. And while Smith is hoping to regain the form which made him the Dolphins' leading rusher in each of his first two seasons, Tony Page never missed a beat finishing third on the Dolphins in receptions with 57, fifth best among NFL running backs. But it's hard blocking, enthusiasm, and leadership which make his value hard to articulate, but easy to appreciate. And while Tony Page does as much with his hands as his feet, in week four, Joe Robbie Stadium was anticipating quite a different sort of feat. Don Shula's 300th career win. To it. Makowski drops into the end zone to throw. Good protection. Now he fumbles the ball. Miami recovers for a touchdown. Chuck Klingbeil's recovery helped Miami even its record at 2-2, two and, two, and more significantly, made Don Shula only the second head coach in NFL history to record 300 wins. It's difficult to say which is more impressive, Shula's unabashed achievement or his humility. I've never worried about numbers. Uh, they just naturally happen. You know, the numbers are nice, and, and knowing that you're in a, an exclusive club now at 300 uh, is something that someday I'm sure I'm going to be proud of. Perhaps no other coach would be so modest in the face of such success. But perhaps that's part of why Shula has had so much success. Don Shula is concerned less with what he has accomplished than what he has still to accomplish. Quite frankly, as a teacher, motivator, and master of the game, Shula is without peer. Since 1970, the year Don Shula joined the Dolphins, Miami is the winningest franchise in all of professional sports. But for this future member of the Hall of Fame, win number 300 of his career was followed by loss number three of 1991. What Don Shula and the Dolphins needed was a win, and they got just that when they traveled to New England to take on the Patriots. The Dolphins simply dominated as Dan Marino threw two touchdown passes and the defense collected six sacks and two turnovers. Miami's 20 to 10 victory, even their record at three and three.
It seemed that the Dolphins were finally finding their way through the thicket by seizing the football and whatever opportunity presented itself. The team had been transformed from a unit which not only believed it could, but knew it could and would. Injuries. They're every player's greatest fear and every team's worst nightmare. Here's a give off to Sammy Smith. He fumbles the football in the end zone and the Oilers recover. I can't believe that lightning strikes. In 1991, fluke plays and a rash of injuries conspired against the Dolphins to turn a season of promise into one of pain. The final gruesome number included injuries to 12 starters who lost a combined 72 games. On offense, a battered offensive line deprived Dan Marino of his customary protection. While defensively, five-time All-Pro linebacker John Offerdahl missed the final 10 games of the season. As player after player left the field hobbled, seemingly so too were Miami's chances at salvaging the season. But instead of wallowing in self-pity, the Dolphins fought back, winning five of the next six games to start the season's second half and get right back in the playoff picture, beginning with a season sweep of the Colts. A week later, back home in Joe Robbie Stadium, the Dolphins tried to consign the Patriots to a similar fate. Dan Marino's three touchdown passes proved more than enough to overwhelm the Patriots, but on a star-spangled night, it was the defense which had a banner game by relentlessly pressuring and punishing Patriots. By night's end, the Dolphins had made the Patriots black and blue while finding themselves in the pink at five and five. It said defense wins championships. But what is rarely said about defense is that it's as much a matter of attitude as aptitude. And the 1991 version of the Dolphin defense certainly had the right attitude. Hit first and ask questions later. Of course, youth will be served, and first-year rookie linebacker Brian Cox served up the hits, stifled the run, and sacked quarterbacks with equal relish. Just a rookie, this maestro of mayhem is only going to improve with age. Number 92, left outside linebacker David Griggs was the perfect bookend to Cox. And you don't have to read between the lines to know what Griggs' passion is. Sacking the quarterback. With the speed to pursue and the personality to pounce. Trouble is his business. And nobody closes a deal like Mr. Griggs. Number 37, J.B. Brown, Lewis Oliver, number 25, Jarvis Williams, number 26, and Vesty Jackson are quickly becoming the key players on a secondary, which was the AFC's fourth best last season. Number 28, Michael Magruder saw action in all 16 games and could be counted on to make the play, while number 45, Bobby Harden, used timing and tenacity to clog the passing lanes. Still, the B-2 bombers, Lewis Oliver and Jarvis Williams, represent the ultimate in air defense.
Surely the Dolphins owned the air lanes in 1991, but not every football is launched by hand. Fortunately, the Dolphins are blessed with two right feet. Specifically, punter Reggie Roby and kicker Pete Stojanovic, who led the AFC in scoring. Roby led all NFL punters by averaging better than 45 yards per punt, and like the best, Roby was at his best near the goal line by pooching 17 kicks inside his opponent's 20. While Pete Stojanovic on the other foot set a Dolphin team record by scoring 121 points, and in week 13 against the Bears, it was the kicking game which ultimately decided the outcome. On a frostbitten soldier field, with the howling wind and hostile crowd, the visiting Dolphins took the Bears' best shot, then beat the Bears at their own brutal game. The Dolphins, however, trailed with just over two minutes to play when sublime opportunity resulted from a ridiculous snap. Awaits the snap. Here it is. High over his head. Buford will go back and grab the football. And the Dolphins, as the ball flips in the air, it's loose down inside the five at the three yard line. And Miami will come up with the ball. And the Dolphins come up with the biggest turnover of the ball game if they can get into the end zone for a touchdown. The test of a good team isn't whether they get an opportunity, but what they do with it. Here's the pass play. It is caught by Farrell Edmonds for a touchdown. Farrell Edmonds' touchdown sent the game to overtime, where from out of the pocket came something of a miracle. Clayton was ruled down at the five, but it was the Bears who were down and out in the cold when Pete Stojanovic drilled a 27-yard field goal to give the Dolphins a dramatic 16-13 overtime win. The next week, Chicago snow was traded for South Florida sun as the Dolphins hosted the Buccaneers. And thanks to a rare triple-triple, the Buccaneers were no threat. Tony Martin collected 100 yards receiving. Dan Marino threw for over 300 yards. And Mark Higgs ran for his third 100-yard game, helping the Dolphins win for the fifth time in six weeks. They're the NFL's unknown warriors the offensive line, and in Richmond Webb, Harry Galbraith, Keith Sims, Jeff Uhlenhaek, Mark Dennis, Burt Widener, and Jeff Dellenbach, the Dolphins have some of the very best. They were also able to answer the age-old metaphysical question of what happens when an immovable object, Keith Sims, meets an irresistible force, a Dan Marino pass. Let history show that the answer is a nine-yard completion. For all their considerable talents, however, the offensive line isn't Dan Marino's first option, chiefly because he doesn't have one, but two. And when the choice is between the Marx brothers, the passing game is a serious business. And while number 83 Mark Clayton and Mark Duper number 85 make the passing game poetic, neither is ready to go gently into that good night. Well, they've been a big part of my success, you know, the Marks brothers, and uh, any quarterback needs good receivers, and uh, both of those guys have been very consistent for a long period of time, and uh, I don't know what I'd do without them. No quarterback has ever relied on two receivers more, nor enjoyed as much continued success as Dan Marino has with Mark Clayton and Mark Duper.
1991 marked the third time that Duper and Clayton simultaneously enjoyed 1,000-yard seasons. That unmatched trifecta allowed each to surpass Nat Moore's club record for receiving yardage. What's more, both Duper and Clayton caught 70 passes, proving they know the long and the short of receiving. And sometime next season, each is almost certain to break Moore's team record for career receptions. Of course, football isn't about records. It's about scoring touchdowns. And by happy coincidence, that might be what this dynamic duo does best. In fact, the Dan Marino to Mark Clayton combination is the most prolific scoring pair in history, having found the end zone 76 times, including an AFC best 11 times in 1991. I'm glad you sat up here enjoying this. In the Dolphins' penultimate home game against Cincinnati, the Bengals found out firsthand what the best arm in the NFL can do. Dan Marino threw three touchdown passes, including his 20th of the season for an NFL record ninth time as the Dolphins cruise to their eighth win of the year. Modern science tells us that triskaidekaphobia, the fear of the number 13, is an irrational fear. But then science doesn't have to try and stop Dan Marino, the NFL's best quarterback with the most impressive numerology. In 1991, Dan Marino threw for over 3,900 yards, making him the only quarterback in history to have enjoyed eight seasons of 3,000 or more yards passing. While Marino's remarkable numbers reveal quite a bit about his mastery, it's the marvel of his play in which fans revel. His 25 touchdown passes last season ranked second in the AFC and raised his career total to 266, the third highest in NFL history. And with the quickest release the game has ever seen, number 13's days of great statistics are hardly numbered. Still, even Dan Marino knows that when the numbers aren't there, you've got to take it down and try another way. And despite their second half run, the Dolphins narrowly missed the playoffs. But the future is hardly dark for Miami, because every man who wears the aqua and orange is driven by a competitive fire. From legends like Nick Bonaconti, the newest member of the Dolphins honor roll, to hungry hitters like Jeff Cross, the Dolphins have always been dedicated to full tilt football. The Dolphins will be back next season, a year healthier, a year stronger, and even a year wiser, because 1991 was a year of unforeseen injuries, unsurpassed effort, and unrealized dreams. A year of blood, sweat, and tears. Hi, I'm Steve Sable. As you've just seen, the Dolphins' 1991 season was at best a mixed bag. But improving on last year's 8-8 eight eight record might not be as tough as you think. For starters, Miami probably got the best pure cover man in the draft in Troy Vincent. While their second pick, Marco Coleman, should give the Dolphins their first, their first legitimate pass rush in years. Of course, the real treat in Miami is Dan Marino and the Marx Brothers, who are as sweet a passing combination as any in the NFL. 
So, the only question on offense is whether Sammy Smith will rebound from his disappointing season or whether Mark Higgs will have to pick up from where he left off last season. Last year, the Dolphins' season was blood, sweat, and tears. But with their off-season acquisitions and some time to recuperate, Don Shula's team is hoping next season will be more like blood, sweat, and cheers. What's new in South Florida football? Well, not much. As they have for the last 22 years, the Dolphins are back at St. Thomas University for training camp. And it seems for almost that long, the Dolphins have been trying to overcome the same tribulation. In other words, if Miami were on trial, the verdict would be rendered quickly because the defense has rested. Well, there's no question everybody realizes where we need improvement. Uh, we need defensive help. We need it up front. We need bigger, stronger people up front. The Dolphins do have a genuine pass rusher in Jeff Cross. Number 91 has led the Dolphins in sacks for each of the past three seasons. The question is, who can bear the burden besides Cross? One possibility is T.J. Turner, number 95, one of five Dolphins to start at nose tackle last season. Another is Chuck Klingbile, who enjoyed a solid rookie season by finishing third in sacks. There's also Sean Lee, a second-year pro who, like Turner and Klingbile, has yet to reach his potential because of injuries. But injuries and inconsistency on the line aren't Don Shula's only concern. We need a linebacker that can rush the passer and put the pressure on the passer and be aggressive and upfield against the run. Number 93 Cliff Odom is a good linebacker. He'll also be 34 next season. So although Odom finished third on the team in tackles last season, he's not Shula's long-term solution. David Griggs, number 92, however, might be. He's arguably the Dolphins' second best defensive player. And except for perennial All-Pro John Offerdahl, he's been Miami's most consistent defender for the past two years. Offerdahl is one of the game's best, but last season he missed the final six games with a knee injury. Good, Mike. Good work, Mike. Mikey. Nice inside out, man. Nice inside out. Yeah. How Offerdahl's rehabilitation goes is of primary importance. So is the secondary. And we need secondary people, especially corner types, because now you're playing against the four wide receivers, three wide receivers, and uh, uh, Buffalo, for example, is, is a team that we've got to beat. And you're playing against uh, Jim Kelly and that uh, no huddle offense, and uh, you know the great receivers that they have, Andre Reid and Lofton, and uh, uh, these are just outstanding people. So you need corners that can cover. And that's something that I think most teams are searching for, but something that we need desperately. The Dolphins' secondary is not as porous as it is young. As a rookie last season, number 42 Chris Green displayed good instincts for the ball, as did second-year corner Michael McRuder. Still, Miami is most comfortable when it remembers safety first, and in Lewis Oliver, the Dolphins have a solid last line of defense. Last season, the Dolphins forced only 21 turnovers, but more vexing than that was the offense's tendency to lose the ball. Moreover, Dan Marino was sacked 28 times, more than the previous two seasons combined. Be assured, Don Shula will not countenance a repeat of last season. The fumbles may well have been as much bad luck as bad form. While a healthy offensive line should afford Marino the protection, which has made him virtually unsackable in the past. It's no secret what the Dolphins' playbook holds, Dan Marino, and lots of them. But turn the page, and you'll discover that fullback Tony Page is an integral part of Miami's attack. 
Still, Marino's favorite targets are considerably more conspicuous. Last season, Mark Duper again proved he was one of the league's elite receivers by snaring 70 passes for more than 1,000 yards. And while Duper's scoring production has slackened, it's less a statement about his abilities as it is a testimony to the remarkable relationship Marino has developed with Mark Clayton. It didn't take Dan Marino long to realize that Clayton knew what to do and that he was going to get open in critical situations for him. So consequently, this confidence has built up through the years where Dan, as he uh, went back to pass in a, a long yarded situation or down close to the goal line, he always had the confidence that Clayton somehow was going to get open on the coverage and give him uh, somewhere to throw the football with a good chance of getting open and making the big play. And through the years, this confidence builds and consequently the statistics build up and that's why they're the top combination right now in uh, professional football. That combination should make the possibility of Miami victories considerably better than a 50-50 proposition in 1992. Where the Dolphins will finish next season is open to conjecture, but there's no doubting they know where to start. The most famous Dolphins of all were the Super Bowl champions of 1972 with four Hall of Famers on offense, but perhaps the most remarkable thing about that 72 season was the Dolphin defense. All they did was invent situation substitution, lead the league in defense, and carry the Dolphins to the only perfect season in NFL history. Yet, none of those players are in the Hall of Fame. In fact, history refers to them with the ultimate example of anonymity, the no-name defense. But before we take a look at the no-name defense, we're going to take a look at one receiver who needs no introduction at all. He was to receiving what Nuryev was to the ballet. Of course, it's Paul Warfield, an all-time classic. The storm clouds of a Cleveland winter opened to a glow that heralded the arrival of Paul Warfield. Some receivers break records, but he broke new ground in the art of catching the football. And while others drew watercolors, Warfield painted oils. It just popped my eyes open to watch him. I mean, his, uh, his fluid uh, movement but the overpowering speed that he had in trying to cover the guy was a man-sized job because he had the great speed, but he could cut on a dime. He was a touchdown scoring receiver. I bet you his record on scoring points is right up at the top in the all-time history of the league. Hot to trot and too cool to catch, Warfield outraced the 60s with the Browns, then sped into the 70s with the Dolphins, turning the routine into the spectacular. The great ability to make something happen after the catch, to turn a five yard apparent gain into a 50 yard gain or better. There was a play uh, many years ago against the Raiders on a rainy night in, in Miami where he caught a ball, broke away from some uh, defenders and did a pirouette and uh, got away and got into the end zone. Just one of the, the great plays, poetry in motion. concentration level was so great that when the football basically was coming in flight, I could block out everything else uh, that was occurring in that environment. I was not aware of the defender. I was not aware of the stadium crowd or the thousands of people there. It was just that football, and I had an obsession with catching it and always catching it at its highest point. had that, those subtle moves that you really don't see where he can get a defensive back off balance and make the break. A lot of those great receivers have that. They don't just come down and break. They've done something in that move to get the 
guy off balance, and he was a master at that. He had a very unique ability to catch the ball inside, too, and had no fear. And the great receivers will catch and go inside and catch the ball. Paul Warfield was one of them. You could beat him up all day long. He'd come back and run the plan pattern, little curl in patterns. He knew he was going to get hit. He just couldn't intimidate the guy. He'd come in the middle, he'd catch passes, and he was just a complete wide receiver. The post pattern should be renamed the Warfield because he reshaped it into a perfect form where every step counted. I virtually learned to be very precise and I would run patterns hour after hour. I would make a post pattern look like a post pattern drawn up on the board, not rounded off or not bent off, but straight, precise angles. I never wanted to be in a ball game where I'd be so totally surprised that I could not react and I would be ineffective. So it took a lot of study off of the field. On the field, the student became the teacher. And in this classroom, Warfield wrote some key chapters in NFL history. After five glorious seasons in Miami, Warfield returned home in 1976 to play out his 13-year career with the Cleveland Browns. It proved poetic justice for the man they call poetry in motion. Although many receivers are considered royalty, they were just playing in the court of the king, Paul Warfield. They were tough, intelligent, disciplined, aggressive. They were hard-nosed, persistent, stifling, opportunistic. The Miami defense was the backbone of the Dolphins' dynasty of the early 70s and helped lead them to three straight Super Bowls, including a perfect season in 1972. Still no member of this unit is in the Hall of Fame. In fact, it was made up of a group of players so anonymous, they became known as the No Names. I think someone just wrote about uh, uh, the fact that they analyzed the defense, but uh, as they looked around, they said it's really a no-name defense. And I think at first, uh, the players sort of resented it, but after a while, it sort of became uh, sort of a, uh, uh, an affection for them. They, they really felt good about it. And matter of fact, I remember someone took a picture and put it on a poster, and it said, the no-name defense, can you recognize these players? And it had us wearing uh, masks, little Long Ranger masks. The most famous, make that the least unknown of the group, was linebacker Nick Bonaconti, though he hardly fit the mold of a premier defender. He was too small and uh, he wasn't fast, you know, and, and right now, if he were coming out of college and all of his stats were in the computer, I guarantee you he would be a reject. He would never get a chance to come to an NFL camp. But the thing that you can't measure with a computer is heart. That's what Bonacani had. Plus, he had this tremendous uh, leadership ability. He wouldn't stand for anything but best effort. He wouldn't tolerate mistakes by his teammates, and he never made any mistakes himself. Following Bonaconti's lead were defensive ends Bill Stanfield, number 84, and Vern Dan Herder, number 83, as well as tackles Bob Heinz and number 75, ferocious Manny Fernandez. But overall, the Dolphins weren't quite as physical as they were tactical. Defensive coordinator Bill Arnsparger was a mastermind who brought about the advent of situation substitution with the 53 defense, named for its key component, number 53, linebacker Bob Matheson. 
The 53 defense shows the brilliance of Bill Arnsbarger. I think we ended up with a, a defensive lineman short, and, and Matheson was the biggest uh, linebacker we had. So Bill puts him up on the end of the line and says, well, we'll rush him. Arnsbarger's use of a linebacker as a pass rusher revolutionized pro football and befuddled every offense the Dolphins faced. The whole idea to our defensive scheme was to keep the offense off guard, to not let them know who is coming or where they're coming from so that they would make a mistake. Equally as frustrating for opponents was Miami's nearly impenetrable secondary, where number 40, Dick Anderson, Lloyd Mumford, Curtis Johnson, and number 13, Jake Scott, skillfully disguised their zone coverages and rarely made an error in judgment. Bill Arnsbarger said, in the year that we went undefeated, we made 13 mental mistakes the entire year. That is incredible. Miami made its opponents pay dearly for every mistake. Yet perhaps no play better illustrates the Dolphins' defensive teamwork than a Dick Anderson interception against the Colts in the 1971 AFC Championship. It was a 62-yard return uh, where our defensive players made uh, seven perfect blocks. A once in a lifetime opportunity. There were Colts just laying on the ground, and all I had to do was run around them. Funny story about that is Nick Bonacani keeps telling me that, you know, I was so slow that he went out and got a hot dog, and when I came back, I was still running, and I said, that's because you're the only one that didn't make a block. They say that nobody's perfect. But in the early 70s, the Dolphins' defense marched in near precision. They were heroes whose identities remained a mystery. And to this day, we still wonder just who were those masked men? Individually, they weren't any names, but together they were the no-names. We didn't mind that term at all. We didn't have any stars on that team. We had a lot of great individuals that uh, played as a group, and, and yeah, we wore that as a badge.